Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Steve, and also thank you, George. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate George to lead us in closing prayer as well in just a few minutes. Appreciate you, man, the service you render to our congregation. We're grateful for those of you that have uh, listened or are listening to us by way of this telephone service. We appreciate the service itself, but we appreciate the fact that you have taken your time today to worship God through these means. And we are hoping that you had a wonderful week. This has been a great week. It's been hot, I know, very hot. We have had at our house a very enjoyable weekend. Uh, Suzanne's birthday was the other day. And so our son, Ethan, and our daughter-in-law, Kara, uh, came and have spent uh, Friday and Saturday with us. And we'll be going home uh, this afternoon. But we have enjoyed our time together, our visits together. We put them to work a little bit, let them make some design decisions for us that we couldn't make. And uh, we fed them, and we've enjoyed their company tremendously, as we always do. I know you love your children, but we love our children as well. So we're grateful for any time we get to spend with them. And it's been a good weekend for us. I want us to talk this morning about a lesson entitled, God Strengthens. And if you have your Bibles close by, you might want to turn them to Exodus, the sixth chapter. Exodus chapter six. A man one time was having difficulty pushing a car. There was two of them, matter of fact, pushing a car up a hill. <clears throat> the car would not work. They were trying to get it to a safe place, but they were having to push it uphill. And there was an individual passing by that happened to see what was going on. And so he jumped in to help and, and got behind the car and pushed and was able to help the two individuals push the car off the side of the road to safety. When they did, or when he did, the man whose car it was turned to the man who had jumped in. All of a sudden he said, I'm so thankful that you've helped us. You've just given us the strength that we needed to make that little last effort. and We appreciate that. Well, I don't know about you, but there are some times when we all feel, or at least I do, feel whipped or beaten up. We feel discouraged. We, we, we want to give up. We want to quit. We want to throw up our hands and scream and just say, I've had enough. I just can't take it anymore how to face those times in life and how to face that time with regards to serving God, because that's a lot of times what we're saying. I want to quit serving God. I'm, I'm discouraged. I'm upset. I'm tired. Just let me throw in the, the towel and let me quit. Well, in Exodus, the sixth chapter, we have a scenario that is much like that. Moses had been called by God to go and to deliver the children of Israel. You might recall, you go on back to the third chapter and you see where Moses is approached by God in the burning bush and given the commission. He's going to deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. In the fourth chapter, there are some miraculous signs that God gives Moses to let him know that Pharaoh will, will listen. But when Moses goes to, to Egypt, Pharaoh really doesn't listen. And then beginning, especially in the fifth chapter, as Moses has his first encounter with Pharaoh, Pharaoh doesn't listen. Matter of fact, he makes it more difficult for the children of Israel in order to complete their work. And so Moses is pretty much fed up. You know, what can I do? Who am I? Who will listen to me? Who cares? God, you you sent me on an impossible task. He even uh, says in the last two verses of the fifth chapter, he says that... Uh, as he stood there to meet them, or verse 22 said, So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you've sent me? And since this time I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. In other words, Moses says, God, don't get it. They don't get it. Don't understand it. Not only do I not get it and I don't understand it, but it just it doesn't make sense. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Well, it is in the sixth chapter that we get some answers. And really and truly, at least for me, when I 
read and study this passage, it reminds me of the times in which I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up. Here are some reasons why I should not. And here are some reasons that strengthen me in my resolve and in my service to God. Notice, beginning in verse 1 of the 6th chapter, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Notice the first thing. Notice that it says, The Lord said to Moses, And if you're looking at your Bible, you'll notice something that maybe you don't catch or you haven't caught or you haven't caught in quite a while. Notice that the word Lord, especially in the King James, the New King James and some other translations, is all capital letters. Why is that? Well, the translators are trying to help us out a little bit. The word that is used in the Hebrew text is... Actually, we don't have a, a, a way of pronouncing it. It's W-H, V-H, or Y-H. And so it is pronounced by many as Yahweh. Later to become known as Jehovah. Jehovah is believed to be, by a lot of scholars, the name of God. In other words, my name's Paul. My wife's name is Suzanne. Son's name's Ethan. Daughter-in-law's Kara. These are the names that we go by. Well, God is more of a term, Elohim. And, and so when the translators came up to translate, they didn't want to call God by name for fear that they would make him less of God. And so here what they did was they said, okay, where it says Jehovah, we're just going to make it the word Lord, but we're going to make it all capital letters. Well, you might say, well, why do you tell us all that? Because the term that is used here, Jehovah or Lord, is the term that means I am that I am. In other words, here's God telling Moses and telling Israel, Look, you've seen me, you know me, you know God, and you know his powerful acts. I'm not the God of Egypt. I'm the God that is the great God. I am the great I am. And so he's calling, if you will, the children of Israel to experience, and especially Moses, his faithfulness to a promise that was made in Genesis 17. Remember in Genesis 17, the promise was made to Abraham that the children of Israel would receive a land promise. Now, they will a little later on after Exodus, the sixth chapter. But God calls Moses and he says, uh, he says Moses, I'm the Lord. I am that I am. I'm the one that has the power. I promised you, and notice what he says. He says, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. And God said to him, I am, verse 2, the Lord. And then in verse 6, he says it again. I am the Lord. By name, we find strength because what we ultimately find is the power of God. We know that God is the one that the Hebrew writer wrote about in Hebrews chapter one or chapter eleven, excuse me, verse three. By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which were visible. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews eleven verse three, with regards to God. We know by faith and understand that by faith God is the creative power and that he created it, verse 3 of Hebrews 11, out of nothing. And so here that Lord, that Lord, that Jehovah that says, I, I am Jehovah, I am that I am, is saying, Moses, just sit back and relax for a few minutes. Calm down. 
Because I'm the first cause. I'm God. I'm not many gods. I'm not the gods of the Egyptians. I'm not the gods of some foreign land. I am the God that is in charge, that made the world, upholds the world, and have has always been and will always be in charge. The psalmist in Psalm 89 and verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts who is mighty like you, O Lord. The heavens are yours, and the earth also is yours. And so he asked the question, Lord, who's like you? Man, you are tremendous. We know God, and we see his power. We see his power in creation. We see his power in that he made the world and all things therein. There should be strength for us in knowing that the God that we serve is the God that created the world. It is God that is has always been and always will be. I am that I am. I am, I've always been, and I will always be. Dear friends, find strength in that. Find strength in that we are serving a powerful God. We are serving a great God. We are serving a magnificent God who is in control. But then secondly, in our text, in verse 1, but also I want you to jump down for just a minute to verses 6, 7, and 8 of Exodus 6. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, now this is God telling, telling Moses, tell the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Well, we've already talked about that. I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage I am the Lord. (laughs) He is emphasizing that idea that he is the Lord. And we find strength in that. But in verses 6 through 8, we also find strength in his promises. In other words, God says, hey, I want you to know something. I want you to know that I made that promise and I'm going to keep that promise. You just need to to calm down, you need to relax, and you need to know that me being the promise maker is also the promise keeper. That I'll do what I've told you that I'll do. I promised you that land, you're going to get it. Now realize, we might stop here and just say for a minute and note the fact, and need to realize and need to remember, our timeline is not always God's timeline, is it? But that's not the crux of this point. The crux of this point is to understand that God's going to take care of us. And God's going to keep his promises. Well, what are some of his promises? Well, there's a psalm that you're familiar with, I know. But it tells us a little bit more about God and some of his promises. It's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Verses 1 and 2 remind us of a couple of things, don't they? They remind us, first of all, that God provides. Notice what he says in verse 1. I will not want. God provides for us everything that we need. God is the giver, and what he gives is all things. Paul reminds us that all things are yours in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we need to be mindful that everything we have, that we're just simply stewards, entrusted with the items from God, that we're to take care of them, and that God will provide. Psalm 37, David says, I'm young, now old, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken. God provides. Not only does God provide for us, 
but think about what he says in verse 2. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. What does the good shepherd do? The good shepherd always takes his sheep to the next green pasture. Now, green pastures in biblical times and green pastures as we think of them and as probably as David saw them were a little different. Much of the country is hillside and much of it is rocky terrain. And so what happens is, is that the grass kind of grows in lines and the sheep are led and they, they chew, if you will, off and, and they eat off of that line of grass. But the shepherd always leads them to a place where they can eat. And so not only does he provide, but he pilots, he directs. The shepherd always is in front of the sheep, calling the sheep, singing to the sheep, and the sheep follow him. Shepherds do not drive their sheep. They lead their sheep. And so here the shepherd in leading the sheep, pilots them where they should go. And so there's a great promise. I'm going to lead you in green pastures. And then he says in verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The protection that God provides, even in times of death, even in the lowest of what humanity considers the lowest. The psalmist says, God protects. The psalmist said that in Psalm 121, verse 7. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve you going out and you're coming forth from this time forth and even forevermore. That's our God. Our God preserves us. Our God protects us. And then the psalmist says in verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. There's the plenty that God provides. And that's what Malachi said in Malachi 3 verse 10. Remember the prophet there. God, he writes the words of God. He says, bring your your tithes in the storehouse so that there is plenty of food in my house. And he says, and then know this and see this. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings, you do not have stock rooms or you do not have room enough to receive it. God always provides and he always provides plenty for us. And so go back to Exodus 6 now. We find strength by the name of God, but we also find strength in the promises of God. You see, what the psalmist told us was what he had experienced. And he says, here's what I've seen with regards to God. The Bible promises us all of those things. In Titus 1 verse 2, Paul wrote, God cannot lie. There's a lady that was in the hospital once. And she was laying there in the hospital. If you've ever been a patient in the hospital, you know that it's a, it's a lonely time if there's no one there with you. It's a time of reflection, a time of thinking, a time of prayer, wondering when you're going to get better and praying to God that you're going to get better. Of course, it's a lot of tests and a lot of nurses and doctors running in and out trying to figure out what's going on with you as well. But there was a lady one time that was in the hospital. And her daughter showed up, and she had her little son with him, with her. And as she, as the little boy came in, he had a, a card he had made for his grandmother. It was a folded up eight and a half by eleven piece of paper. But he had drawn a picture on the front, and inside he'd written the words that I will be with you wherever you go. And when she opened that up, she thought, oh, what a wonderful, comforting message. And the little boy said, God said that. God said that. I'll be with you wherever you go. That's where we receive strength. And a God that's our shepherd that will watch over us. But then go back to the text. Go back to Exodus chapter 6. Where do we find strength? 
We find strength in his name. We find strength in his promises. But we find strength in his command. Look at beginning in verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, or spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of the land. And Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded to me. How then shall Moses heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. The Lord then spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Basically, God said this, Moses, go. Just go. Just go on. Quit stalling. Moses, remember, made all kinds of excuses why he should not be the leader of the children of Israel. They wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't do so forth and so on. He constantly seems to make excuses to God for why he should stop his service or not render service to God. And God finally just says, go. Get up. Get to it. Get with it. You see, God is telling Moses, don't sit still. Don't stop and don't give up. Get up. Get going. You have a purpose. You have a goal. And when you really stop and think about that and you analyze that, you know that sitting around only causes great woe, great angst, great inward thought. And so God is trying really to stop Moses from that by saying, Moses, get up, get going. You know, God commands us with the same priority. In Exodus 20 and verse 3, there Moses <laughs> received on Mount Sinai the Ten Commandments. You remember what number one is in verse 3? You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, here's your purpose. Here's your priority in life. Understand that I'm to be number one in your life. And that you're always to labor for me. John 6, verse 27. Jesus reminds us, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for everlasting life. And notice that he says about that food, he says, The Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. In other words, God's chosen him. You just be sure you eat of the bread of eternal life. Where does this set our mind then and our goal and our eyes towards heaven? Colossians 3 verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. The command then for us, if you stop and think about it, is one simple word, two letters, G-O, go. Moses, don't sit here. And so Moses finds strength in the fact that he's supposed to get up and go. Well, God's given you that same message. Get up and go. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 19, Go, therefore, into all nations. Have you thought about that lately? We often apply that. Well, you know, we put some money in the, the contribution, and it goes towards missions. Wonderful. Fantastic. That's what we're supposed to do, and that's how the elders are to oversee it. But yet at the same point in time, too, we each have a personal responsibility. And it's interesting because of the verbiage there that the Lord is actually saying, having gone therefore. In other words, it's the idea that God is just assuming, I've given you a message, I've given you a mission. He's Basically, God is just saying, you're going. And when you go, teach all nations. There's what we need to be mindful of. That as Christians, we need to be mindful that we're going and we're sharing the truth of Jesus with others. That we're letting our light shine before men. You see, as Christians, we have a purpose. We have a journey that we're to complete. We're to be heavenward bound at all times. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? One receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. 
Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Therefore, Paul says, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it in subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, I live the life that I talk about so that I won't be seen as being disqualified. That's the message where we receive strength. Moses said that Moses received strength to go lead the children of Israel because God says, I am that I am. Because he had given him promises that he'd take care of him, that he'd get him through it, that the children of Israel would be led out. And we have those promises as well. We find strength in the command of God. Get up, get going. We may be like a little boy sometimes that that uh, told his grandfather, he said, Grandfather, I just don't want to do it, when his grandfather told him to do something. But the reality of it is, is God has given us the message. Get up, get going. But then fourthly, <clears throat> we find we find strength, and God strengthens us, beginning in our text in Exodus chapter 6, verses 14 through 27. It is kind of a strange, if you will, literary device here. All of a sudden, the author, by inspiration, and the author being Moses, puts in the lineage of Moses and Aaron. And some would, would question this. Why, why would God do this? Why did God do that? Well, I believe that basically Moses, if you will, probably looked back over the past. And he looked forward in the future. He looked back to the folks that were, if you will, his cloud of witnesses. You know, a couple of weeks ago we talked about Hebrews 11 verse 1 and, and the cloud of witnesses there mentioned in chapter 12. Verse 1. And we talked about all the great men of faith that should inspire us. Well, Moses and Aaron probably look back. You know, God said, go. Now all of a sudden they're thinking back. Yeah, all of these folks that were our ancestors. And all those that are before us. You see, we sometimes we don't think about people. People have a tremendous impact and influence upon us. Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, God that comforts, comforts us with the coming of Titus. It was Onesiphorus that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 1, who's often refreshed him. And it was Stephanus and Fortichaeus and Antiochus that, uh, or Achaicus, excuse me, that Paul spoke of were spirit refreshers to him in 1 Corinthians 16. Yeah, Solomon was right. Two is better than one. Two being better than one, people help support others. Now, people can tear you down. Yogi Berra, you may recall, was a great catcher for the, the Yankees of years gone by, many years ago. Yogi Berra told a story about a time in which Mickey Mantle had had a tough day. Mickey Mantle told this story as well, so true story. Mickey Mantle had had a tough day. He'd struck out, I think, about three times out of the four at-bats. The last one was, if you will, the clincher. It was the ninth inning. There was a couple of men on. If he could have gotten a base hit, it, at least one or two would have scored, and they would have at least tied up the game, if not won the game. And Mickey Mantle struck out. He felt bad about the day. He was there uh, changing clothes in the clubhouse. Yogi Berra's son was there, his son by the name of Tim was there, and Timmy was just a little boy and quite blunt at the time. And Timmy looked at Mickey as Mickey's uh, place to change clothes was right beside Yogi Berra's. And little Timmy looked at, at Mickey and he says, you stink. Well, some folks are like that. But ultimately, if we'll look to the past and we'll look to the future, we'll find strength. God strengthened Moses by people. If we'll look to the past and look to the future, we often find strength to live the right life, to continue 
parents grow weary, don't they? Parents grow weary in all the day's activities, and sometimes God gets pushed out. Don't. Don't let that happen. Keep struggling. Keep pushing. Grandparents are often put in place of of keeping the grandchildren during the weekends and, and at special times. Be sure that when you keep your children, your grandchildren, that you bring them to church. But not only you bring them to church, but you tell them the Bible stories. You share with them about God. People influence other people. And that's how God gives us our strength. God strengthens us. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 40 verse 41, excuse me, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God strengthens us. The strength is found in God. And we find it in his name. We find it in his promises. We find it in his command. We find it in association with others. Story is told of a man that had several trees that he wanted to cut down on his property. He went to the store. As he went into the store, there was a big sign that said, This saw will cut five trees. You can cut five big oaks and get it all put away in a day. The man bought the chainsaw. He thought, Man, five big oaks, I can get that done. I can, you know, in just a couple of days' work, I'll have cleared what I need to have cleared. He bought the chainsaw. I carried it home. He was very proud. The next day, when the store opened up, he met the, the owner of the store there. He says, this chainsaw will not work. It will not cut five oaks in a day. He said, I didn't get one cut down. So the owner said, well, let's see what's wrong with it. And so they walked outside. The owner looked over the chainsaw. He pulled the cord and the chainsaw started up. The loud noise. And the man jumped back that had bought it. What in the world? What's that? You see, he didn't understand that a chainsaw was powered. He'd always been working with hand saws. Yeah, I know it's an old story. But you see, if he'd have used the power that was there, he could have done the work that as was advertised. Dear friends, you can live the Christian life. The power's there. The strength's there. Just remember to trust in God and follow him. And he will get us through. May God bless you in your service to him. May you find strength in God and strength to continue on. If you want to, if you're coming, be back with us again tonight. We're going to be studying part of the book of Philemon and talk about how to get along with other people. So if you have time this afternoon, you might want to read that. We thank you. We look forward to being with you in person, but we look forward uh, to tonight being with you through means of the telephone. We hope that you'll be back with us again. May God bless you and keep you is our fervent prayer.